Uh, we are in a series on the secrets of the kingdom, which is the parables of Jesus from Matthew 13. I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 13. It's the first gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, it's on page 818 in the Bible near where you're seated, in the rack in front of you if you didn't bring your own. Matthew 13. Last Sunday, we looked at the parable of the soils and four kinds of hearts. The hard heart, the superficial heart, the distracted heart, and the heart that was receptive to the message of the Christ the King. Today we read of three more parables. Jesus brings up the parable of the weeds, and uh, then he explains it in the passage we're going to read. He also tells the story of the mustard seed and the leaven, or the yeast, that infiltrates a loaf of bread. And there's great lessons for us to learn here. So uh, I would like to begin reading at verse 24 of Matthew 13 and read through verse 43. So let's pay attention to the word of the Lord. He put another parable, verse 24, before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants and the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Well, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in the branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables, Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, and here we believe he's uh, quoting Psalm 78, verse 2. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what is hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. The disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the word, world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The son of man will send his angels they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into a fiery furnace. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Lord, as we look at these uh, parables, we know that we need your help to understand them. And so we ask your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and ears so that we can hear and understand and obey what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Like many of you, on Tuesday evening, I was sitting in front of my television watching the election results. And uh, I noted that on one channel... The commentator was talking about uh, the strategy of our president in gaining votes in a state out in the eastern side of our country. 
He said our president had uh, deliberately targeted women, young women, with the message that he was pro-choice and that if they wanted to continue to have that freedom as women, they needed to vote for him. The commentator noted that uh, because we live in a growing secular world and uh, people's moral values are changing, and because so many young people are dropping out of the church, then um, this works to the benefit of a, a political party uh, looking for votes in a, in a secular world. Now when I heard the commentator say that, all politics aside, we'll let the pundits decide whether what he said is true or not. But I thought as a person that follows Jesus Christ, it could be very discouraging to think that people are dropping out of the church and that our country is becoming increasingly secular and that people are just basically trying to find their own way in the jungle of moral values. Um, and my hunch is that others felt discouraged by that as well. This, this constant refrain that we hear from some that the church is dying, that people are dropping out of the church, uh, they're no longer church goers. There's many options out there for religious experience and um, people are choosing by their, their feet, uh, choosing to walk away from the church. It could be very discouraging. Uh, we could think, uh, why is it that our country seems to be losing touch with its vital spirituality? Where's it gone? Now, the encouraging word that I have for you today is that, in many ways, this was like the days of Jesus, because I'm sure the disciples felt the same way that we may feel as, as uh, Christ followers today. Jesus started with great teaching. People flocked to hear him. He was doing stupendous miracles. They were in awe of what was happening. But at the same time, there was a growing sense of hostility. The religious leaders rejected Jesus completely. Many were superficial followers, and when Jesus began to talk about discipleship and dying for the sins of humanity, they walked away from Jesus. Some were wrestling with distractions of life and giving up. And the eleven disciples, I mean even Judas gave up in the end, the eleven must have felt like, uh, what's happening? We have such high hopes for Jesus, and now everything is crumbling around us. It's interesting to note that in the midst of that kind of feeling, Jesus begins to tell parables. And he tells parables to help us understand his kingdom advance in our world and help us make sense out of things that we see around us as followers of Jesus Christ. These parables have direct encouragement for us today. So what I'd like to do is talk, first of all, uh, review a little bit from last week. What, why did Jesus use parables? It wasn't just to tell great stories that people were drawn into, far from the case. Why did he tell parables? Why is it that the parables of soils kind of prepares the ground? And what do these three parables tell us about God's working in the world and our part in it? And keep in mind that the context of this is encouragement. After all, Jesus goes into the house, it says in verse 36, and explains this to his disciples who must have witnessed the growing hostility toward Jesus. Is it any different today? I don't think so. So what can we learn? Well, first of all, why did Jesus use parables? Last week we looked at Matthew 13, verses 10 through 17, and we learned that parables reveal that God's kingdom message comes as a gift for those humble enough to receive it. Uh, Jesus tells parables for people who are humble, humbly wanting to receive more. And he says that parables, uh, far from confusing people who are humbly coming to him as king, cause them to understand even more deeply the realities of life with God in our world. But he also said that parables hide the truth from those whose hearts are not 
responsive to him. He said, in fact, his very use of parables causes more confusion for people who are hard-hearted or distracted or superficial in their understanding. They bring confusion. He goes on to say in verses 34 to 35 that in quoting Matthew or Psalm 20, Psalm 78, 1 to 2, in fact, I'd just like to read that for you. Psalm 78, give ear, O people, to my teaching. Incline your words to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parable. I'll utter dark sayings from of old. Jesus quotes this, or Matthew quotes this, and commented on Jesus' use of parables. And what's he mean by it? He means that in the days of old, that is the Old Testament, there were prophecies, psalms, narrative literature that all pointed to Jesus Christ. It was hidden in the past, kind of mysterious to people because they didn't understand it fully, but now Jesus has come and it's making more and more sense. And what those Old Testament stories are telling people is that Jesus comes not once but twice. He comes in His first advent as a suffering servant who will die for the sins of humanity. He will come as the victorious judge at the end of the age and right all wrongs, deal with injustice, and reign forever as the eternal king. Now, when he used parables, those that were humble received it and even learned more. But those who resisted it became more confused. It's like the guy who went to church. Somebody said, well, where'd you go this weekend? Oh, I went to church. Well, what'd they do there? Oh, there was a speaker there and he had a talk and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Didn't make a bit of sense to me. Well, that's what Jesus promised would come because of his very use of parables. My son had a pet. I know we were hard on our kids. We wouldn't let them have dogs and cats, but we, other, we did allow for aquatic pets. And uh, he had a, a albino water frog. Have you ever seen an albino water frog? And this little frog, he's about this big, and he lived in a fishbowl. This albino water frog's name was Freddy. Freddy the frog. I was so impressed with Freddy because he would swim around in that fishbowl and dive down on the bottom, and he could hold his breath for hours. I mean, he was a rock star as far as I was concerned. I mean, hold his breath like that. The problem that Freddie had was that sometime he, sometimes he would stink up the fishbowl. This happens with frogs. And so um, his owner, his master, would have to clean out the fishbowl. And I saw Freddie in action. When that net came into that fishbowl, Freddie was frantic. He would try the best that he could to avoid that net. He was petrified. And I thought, looking at Freddie, if I could become an aquatic albino water frog, I could tell Freddie, Freddie, it's going to be better for you, man. They're going to rip you out of here and it's going to be scary. I admit it. But they're going to put fresh water in and when you get in there, you're going to say, oh, it doesn't get any better than this. Freddie, if you could just chill out. Now, you say, why do you tell that story? Well, in many ways, it must be similar for God to look at humanity and how we struggle with life. And so God became a human being in Jesus. Not an albino water frog, but a man walking with human skin. God and man. And He brought the message to them. But humanity had their fingers stuck in there. Can you imagine Freddy sticking his finger? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me. And that's what Jesus is saying through the parables. It's as if people have stuck their fingers in their ears and they don't want to hear it. I had the great privilege just uh, three weeks, four weeks ago to be in Sarajevo, Bosnia, visiting our friends Jill and Larry Couch, longtime members of our church, our partners in Sarajevo. This picture was taken on the balcony of their flat, 
What a beautiful view of the city of Sarajevo. It's like it's in a bowl. And um, we know of the stories of the war during 1992 to 1995, but here Larry and Jill have this flat and they overlook the whole city. But you notice the yellow building right in front. You know what that is? It's a mosque. And if I were to take you there and you could look out over the city, you would see mosques all over the city. And at certain times of the day, in fact, five times a day, the loudspeakers would be calling out. Some would be live prayers. Others were pre-recorded. But it'd be, ah, something like that. For me as a visitor, it was kind of, you know, spooky. But uh, the missionaries are, are used to it. But five times a day, those mosques are calling on the Muslim people to pray, to pray to Allah. And I thought to myself, as I learned about this ministry, and we visited three small home churches, less than one-tenth of one percent of people who live in Bosnia are Bible-believing Christians in such a small area. And, and you think, the word that they hear every day is Allah. Just think of how big the job is to get the gospel to them. But then I think of our own country where over 40% in our own city go to church every week and Bibles sit on our shelves and the message of the gospel goes out day after day after day on the radio. And yet people stick their fingers in their ears. I don't want to hear it. It's heartbreaking. Now we might ask the question, Jesus is telling parables, but why is there so little response to the message of the king? 75% failure rate in the parable of the soils. Well, actually, the parable of the soils reminds us of why people reject the message. If you look again at uh, this passage here, we see that Jesus cries out, Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are laden, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But there's rejection, and the reason for that is in Matthew chapter 13, 1 through 23, Jesus said that God's Word is sown broadly as a gift, but with mixed results. God brings His message to bear of Christ and His kingdom, but there's mixed results. Some soils are unproductive. The man sits in a church, dragged there by his spouse, and he's got his blackberry, and during the whole service, he's checked out. He's living in a 45-year-old body, but he's fuming because he even has to be there, and so he's checking his emails and working on his Blackberry during the church. We care less about the message. Um, there's another person who starts out well, and she even wants to get into Bible study and starts to study the Bible, and it uh, seems like something she's really getting into, and then heart aches come discouragements come and she gives up. She has a very superficial understanding of things and just checks out. And somebody else, I mean, they're just plain have no margins in their lives. They go to work, they're trying to take their kids to three or four sports, they've got a mortgage to be concerned about, they're trying to uh, save money for retirement, they're taking a vacation here and there, and they've got so many things going on, they just don't have the margin for it. And Jesus says, as you share the gospel with people like that, that are hard-hearted or superficial or distracted, that's the way it is. Because the Word of God comes free, a gift, but with mixed results. And then he says this, but there's one soil, the receptive heart, who hears and understands and watch out for the results. The Word of God comes with power hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. I mean, most farmers would ha be happy for a twentyfold increase in their crops, let alone thirty, sixty, and one hundred. So Jesus says that as we go about living in His kingdom and as the Word goes out as a huge gift, some receive it humbly and understand more. And others resist and become more hardened. 
Now, that can be discouraging until we realize that God's Word and kingdom seems insignificant at times, but that it advances with great power. You see, Jesus goes on to tell these stories about a mustard seed and leaven to show that though things begin small in the kingdom of God, they grow. They grow. There was a time when not one child was reached by angel tree. Now there have been nine million children who have been touched by angel tree. It begins small. He says in verses 31 to 32, there is a mustard seed conspiracy. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a smallest grain of a mustard seed planted. And then it grows up and becomes such a large plant in the garden, it almost looks like a tree, and the, it's so large the birds roost in it. And he says, also, it's like the power of yeast, or leaven, verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that a woman hid uh, three measures of flour until it was all leavened, and that that bread was rising and became an abundant loaf of bread. Jesus' point is that the kingdom of God comes with small beginnings but will grow in influence. It will advance. We know how this operates. Now at this point I need to pause because some people have translated this as further evidence of the work of the devil. They say, now you know, the devil is the one who comes and steals the, the seed off the, off the path. And they say the devil is the one who, like a bird, takes that seed. And the devil, you know the devil, he, 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 birds are evil and, and they roost and they, it just shows that the kingdom of God is constantly threatened by the devil. And they say leaven, you look in the Old Testament, leaven is often used as a symbol of evil. And even in the New Testament there's passages that show that leaven kind of leavens the whole loaf and causes uh, sin to be pervasive. And they say, you know, this is what it means, that, that our, our society will be filled with evil, the church will be filled with evil, and, and Satan is always putting the kingdom work at risk. Now that is, uh, it makes some sense in context, but I would just hasten to add this. In verse 36, the disciples pulled Jesus away and asked him privately, what do these parables mean? Jesus' goal in telling these parables is to encourage Christ followers. The context is encouragement. And so I believe he's telling these parables to show that that one seed that falls on receptive heart, 30, 60, 100 fold increase, is like a small mustard seed when it begins. And it grows up in influence. It's like a piece of leaven that's put into the bread and causes the whole loaf to rise. The kingdom of God always starts small and grows. I think this is the encouragement Jesus wants to give us. Let me give you an example of this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, very few people followed him. We know that in that upper room in Acts chapter 1, very small group who really believed in him. And then the Holy Spirit came, and it seemed as if the church began to grow and expand. There is a historian and sociologist named Rodney Stark. I've understood uh, from a friend of his that he's now become a Christian, but he wrote a book before becoming a Christian that was called The Rise of Christianity, and as a subtitle, How the Obscure Marginal Jesus Movement Became the Dominant Religious Force in the Western World in Just a Few Centuries. Rodney Stark. I think he's a professor at Baylor University now. He says that from those early beginnings of Christianity in the book of Acts, within 300 years had grown from a few hundred to a few thousand to 34 million people in 300 years. The early growth of Christianity was explosive. In fact, he says, when the Emperor Constantine decided to make Christianity the religion of the state, he may have done it out of political expedience rather than his own heartfelt conversion because during his reign, 56% of the Romans converted to Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that in our world today, 1.4 billion people profess to believe in Jesus. 
and through the work of organizations like Wycliffe that we support through John and Becky Leverington, 5,000 out of the 6,500 languages of our world have been translated and people have received Bibles in their own language. These are all evidence of a kingdom that begins small and grows in strength and power. And I believe Jesus told these parables for people like us that may be discouraged by the things we see happening in our culture to remind us that His kingdom comes freely to all who receive it. And those that do receive it, there is an advance that seems amazing. But let's be honest. The question is if Christianity is to be a growing faith, maturing faith, advancing in our world, why then in Europe, in the United States of America, do it, does it seem like it's declining? Why are people declining from attending church? And um, why is it that people are choosing multiple religious options for their spiritual growth rather than following the king? Well, I believe that is the meaning of this parable of the weeds. Jesus tells us unequivocally in verses 24 to 30 and then explains it in verses 36 to 43 that under his rule, evil exists alongside of good in his kingdom. Evil exists alongside of good. He explains this through the parable of the weeds. He says in verse 24 that a kingdom of heaven is like a man sowing wheat but is sabotaged by an enemy sowing weeds. How would you like to live next to a bioterrorist? And you wake up one morning, you've planted your wheat crop, and up springs these little plants, and you think, oh, it looks like I have more wheat than I thought, only to find out that this extra wheat is not wheat, but darnel is the name, darnel, which is a noxious weed that looks a lot like wheat in its early stages. And it begins to grow. And so the servants, Jesus says in this parable, come to the master and they say, hey, we got weeds. Should we rip them out? Now, surprisingly, the master says no. I mean, I don't know many farmers that would say, nah, let the weeds grow. I mean, they pour chemicals on them, they get out there and pull the weeds. Any gardener, I bet, in this church goes out and weeds. I know when I was growing up, that was one of my jobs, to go out in the hot Iowa sun and get baked to... to well, I don't want to go into that. That's a painful memory. But <laughs> uh, no farmer wants to allow weeds. So it's surprising. He says, no, don't pull it up. Why not? Because he said the root system underneath will get tangled up, and when you pull the weeds, you may pull wheat. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? I think that what Jesus is telling us is that there will be a delay in the fruition of his kingdom. His kingdom has come in part now, but it will come in its fullness later. But in this delay, he exercises his mercy. Look again at verse 30. You see what he's saying? They say, oh, let's pull out the weeds. He says, no, let both weeds and wheat grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. You see, what Jesus is saying is that during this season of the life of his kingdom, there will be evil growing alongside good. But he is still in control. Who is the farmer? The Son of Man, Jesus. Jesus is still in control. He is still in control. And we are to expect evil until he comes to reign. Now, I want to tell you something about this. The fact that Jesus Christ promises a delay is one of the most merciful acts, maybe the most merciful act in all of history. Because rather than come in and look at an evil society that does not submit to his reign, which he could extinguish with a word from his mouth and the angels coming as reapers, he delays his judgment. Have you thought about that? 
I wonder how many people have come to know Christ in the last 50 years. Aren't you glad he delayed? I wonder how many people in this room have come to know Christ and begun to follow him and have been born again since the year 2000. Aren't you glad he delayed? I wonder how many people have come to know Christ since we moved into this church in year 2008. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ delayed to show you his mercy and give you time to humbly come to him? My hunch is that there's someone here today who will say, I'm glad he didn't come today. Because today, you will own up to the fact that you cannot atone for your own sins. And you're going to trust in Jesus as your Savior and be born again. We have an amazingly merciful Savior. And He comes in His first advent to suffer and to die on the cross and to rise again. And He delays up to this very day so that people that currently have hard hearts, superficial hearts, and distracted hearts will bow the knee and acknowledge His kingdom. But I think there's a second aspect to this parable that we must go on to explore. Evil does exist alongside of good, and one part of it is that there is a delay, but the other part of it that we find in verses 36 through 43 is that there will be a divisive division. There will be something decided and divided. For instance, as you read through these verses, beginning in verse 36, you see that the sower of the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus. You see that the good seed means people who respond to the kingdom. He's changing the image from the parable of the soils, from the Word of God being the seed, to people who respond. He says that the field is not the church, but the world. God's kingdom is greater than the church. It involves the whole universe. And it's not just the church he's talking about. He's talking about the world in which we live. Who sows the bad seed? Well, it's the devil. Who are the harvesters when the harvest comes? The angels at the end of the age. What will happen to those who reject the message of Christ and his kingdom? There will be hell to face. And what will happen to people who are following Jesus, have been born again and just want to humbly come to Him? Well, they'll shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. You see, there will be a decisive division. Look again at verses 40 to 42. Jesus says, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Let him who has ears, let him hear. Jesus is offering here a warning and an assurance. In the warning, he says, there'll be a divisive division. Those who reject Jesus face an eternity in hell. There will be weeping and sadness. Oh, I wish, I wish I'd listened to the message. There will be gnashing of teeth, that is regret. I assumed because I couldn't see him that there was no God But now, two seconds after I breathe my last, I know the truth. There will be weeping and gnashing. There is no evidence of a second chance, no evidence of purgatory. These words should move us to sadness. Jesus could not speak about hell without weeping. There's no delight in this that people are rejecting Christ and they'll say, no, I don't want to do your will, God. My will be done. And God says, okay, your will be done. It's tragic. It's hurtful. It's painful. It ought to move us to tears. But Jesus says at the end of the age, there'll come a time of reckoning. But there's also an assurance here. 
because for those Christians that are so discouraged and face so much evil in their lives, and some of our third world brothers and sisters endure persecution like we cannot believe, the encouraging thing is that those who humbly receive Jesus will someday shine as the sun in his kingdom, in the kingdom of the Father. Someday all injustices will be confronted and Christ will reign supreme. My friends, Jesus died on the cross to save us from hell. This message comes out over the radio waves, through our television programs, through our Bibles, day after day after day. Jesus came to suffer and die and take on his own shoulders our sins and to rise again. And his offer of free grace goes out day after day. Humbly receive me. I am the king. I am the king of a great kingdom. And those that do can be assured that they can be his throughout eternity. His delay is a sign of his mercy. You may be sitting here today working on your Blackberry, looking through emails. Jesus Christ is delaying for you. You might be superficial in your understanding and almost ready to give up on the Christian faith because you didn't realize how much suffering there would be. Jesus Christ delays for you. You might be saying, I'm so busy, I'm so distracted, I don't have time for God. Jesus Christ delays for you. And for those that receive him, he is coming with power to transform. If you're not a Christian yet today, would you please take this seriously? Would you see this delay of Jesus as his word, his offer of forgiveness? And would you, where you're seated right now, bow before him and admit your guilt of offending a, a holy God and place your trust in Jesus alone for salvation? Jesus says in John 3, 3, be born again. You can be born from on high today, right where you're seated just by opening your heart and saying, oh God, change me. Come into my life and make me a new person. Show me what it means to be your follower. You may be a discouraged Christian here today. You see evil all around you. You see evil in your own family. You've been witnessing to your dad for years and he closes his heart, sticks his fingers in his ear. You may be witnessing to your child, but they're so superficial. Oh, God, does, he must not exist because look at the suffering in our world. You might be somebody who's been witnessing to your neighbor and they are so packed with schedule, they don't have time for God. And you say, what's the use? Jesus Christ says to you, I am the king. Trust in me because in our world and in my kingdom, evil will exist with good. But someday I'll just, I will have a decisive decision. If you're a discouraging question, discouraging Christian, would you please see that Jesus is still in control? He's still the Son of Man who oversees his kingdom, even though evil grows along with good. And third, if you are a Christian who wants to grow, Will you get off the bench and into the abundant life? Will you say, Holy Spirit, come into my life and guide me on a daily basis. I surrender to your empowerment and I want you to be in control. Would you pray for the people around you? I don't mean just pray when you think of it at meals. I mean really pray. I mean Muslims pray five times a day. And the Apostle Paul said, be constant in prayer. So would you begin to pray for the people around you, the people at work, the people most resistant to you, your parents, your children, pray. And would you also join God, not only in praying, but in showing kindness. A good place to begin is to go right out this, this room and pick up something on the angel tree and decide to give a gift to a child or to volunteer to help in some way. That'd be a good way to begin. Get into the action. And the third thing is, 
would you please join our God in opening your mouth to share the good news of Jesus? Sometimes it's just an identification. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me tell you what I learned at church yesterday. Let me tell you what God answered for me in a prayer I was praying. Open your mouth. Explain the gospel. Because right now, right now, Jesus in his infinite mercy is delaying until the fullness of his kingdom comes when he comes in power to reign forever. Let's stand, shall we? Lord, we're so grateful for your intervention in our lives. I don't believe my brothers and sisters would be here today unless in some way you drew them here. We may even have visitors and guests who have come today for the first time. And I would pray, Lord, that the truth of the gospel might penetrate our, our ears and our hearts and move us to action. Thank you for your encouragement that though we live in a world where evil and good exist side by side, you are still the king and your message of the kingdom continues to ring out. And Lord, if there's anyone here who does not yet know you, I pray that they would not leave today without settling this or talking with someone about it further. Help us not to make assumptions that we'll regret. So Father, as we stand before you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, move among us, change us, transform us, and may you receive the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming today. I'd like to ask the Lord's blessing on you. And if you're a member, I would say again, we expect you at 3.30 for the prayer meeting if possible, but especially 4 o'clock for a congregational meeting. So blessing, blessing. And I'll stick around up here. If somebody wants to come and pray, I'd be glad to help. We have other leaders as well. So thank you for coming. You're dismissed.